The agenda is set. Hello, everyone. I'm Brent Goff in Berlin. America torn apart again over race and guns. Is justice something in the eye of the beholder there? That and more today. It's time to talk. Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman, both American tragedies, products of a society that will not control its guns and seems unable to heal its racial wounds. Is that the America of Barack Obama? Well, justice on trial in the U.S. and also in Russia. This week, we get the verdict in a trial that some say is designed to snuff out a vocal critic of the Kremlin. Alexei Navalny is an enemy of Russian President Vladimir Putin. His future as a political leader could be decided this week. Today, we ask if Navalny is about to become a casualty of the system he wants to change. And the NSA spying story creating scandal here in Germany. It appears the Americans have been able to spy on Europe with lots of European help. Shock in Germany reports that the country's intelligence services worked with the NSA to collect data on people right here. Even the German chancellor has asked Washington to respect German law as it sneaks through the data sphere. Well, I've invited three people today to talk, argue, and pry apart these headlines. My first guest is a Berlin government insider when it comes to high tech spying. He's been on the show before. I'm happy to welcome again Zandro Geinken. He's an advisor to the German government on cyber warfare. He's our point man today on the NSA scandal and what it means here in Germany. It's good to have you on the show again, all Sandro. Right. My second guest knows all too well how rough Russia can be for political dissenters. She had to leave the country. I am happy to welcome Anastasia Rybachenko, a Russian opposition activist. And she is our expert today to talk about what is going on in Russia. Anastasia, it's good to have you on the show as well. And my next guest has been busy trying to understand what the names Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman tell us about American society. I'm happy to welcome to the show Baron Pickert. He is editor at the Foreign Desk with the Tatz newspaper here in Berlin. And we're going to be talking with you, Baron, about what this trial and the verdict, what it means about American society. The United States has an African American president. It is the modern melting pot seen as a role model for much of the world. So why does it feel like we are back in the 20th century? Well, last weekend's not guilty verdict for George Zimmerman has unleashed anger and protest. African Americans are saying that they are second class citizens in the eyes of the law. And if you are happy to carry a gun, many say the courts are on your side. Trayvon Martin died in February 2012 after a violent confrontation with George Zimmerman. Zimmerman, who had set up a neighborhood watch scheme to address crime near his home, saw Martin passing and called police to say he suspected him of criminal intent. He says Martin subsequently attacked and injured him, so Zimmerman fired his gun in self-defense. Zimmerman's detractors have called him a racist vigilante who killed Martin because he was African-American. Anger has also been directed at the police, who initially failed to arrest Zimmerman, saying they accepted his claim that he had acted to protect himself. Florida's state laws have also been criticized. They allow people who fear for their lives to use deadly force without even trying to flee a confrontation. After the not guilty verdict, community leaders called for nonviolent protests. But across the U.S., there is still outrage that a 17-year-old boy was shot dead and no one has been held accountable. Bear, let me pick up with you on this story. Um, how are you explaining this story to your audience? I mean, how should the world understand what is happening in the U.S. right now? Well, I think it's a mixture of uh, different factors, one being the gun laws that uh, almost everybody who wants to and intends to can have a gun and carry it even. Um, then it's the stand your ground law in uh, Flor Florida, which, uh, as we just heard, uh, allows you to uh, defend yourself if you just feel 
threatened. Right. You don't have to prove that you, there was really a threat for your life, but if you just feel threatened, then you can lose, uh, use even deadly force, and that's why George Zimmerman and the initial uh, investigation, which was not really an investigation, was not even arrested after the killing of Trayvon Martin. Let me let me ask um, everyone here, Anastasia and Zandro, um, you know, if you had to give me you know, a couple of words explaining what this trial and the verdict means. Um, what would you say? Uh, um, what's it about? I mean, I just want to, I want to see how well informed um, we are about what's going on. Sandra, what would you say it's well, about? I'll the trial pretty harsh to judge, but uh, as a German, I mean, one, one thing that's really disturbing me is this whole concept of an armed neighborhood watch. Uh, I think that, that from a German point of view, where you have the, the state of law and, and all these kinds of things, this whole idea of having people without professional education, professional training, uh, armed out in the streets and being able to judge for themselves if they want to shoot criminals or not, that just seems to be entirely wrong. And so I think that's a big part of the problem, at least from a German perspective. So for you, for you it's about gun control. Anastasia, what about for you? Mm, I, I have um, a special view uh, even on the topic of immigration, honestly speaking. And I, for example, call uh, immigration in Germany positive immigration, especially in Berlin, because uh, immigrants here, uh, they used to be not used to be criminals. And it's not like in Russia or in America, because here they have social care um, and they not should uh, to do any crimes. Okay. And, uh, that is the uh, most important reason to prevent these uh, uh, problems uh, with uh, criminal situation. In Moscow, it's a little bit different. Okay. Well, what's interesting here is we're, we're not hearing anyone saying um, anything, uh, racism. And you, uh, what the, the main discourse in the United States right now um, is about the fact that Trayvon Martin was an African-American man. Um, w how do you explain, Baron, this disconnect that once you leave the United States, people don't talk about race as much as, they, as they're talking about guns? Well, actually, we, we talked about racism in this case um, because obviously uh, Trevor Martin was on his way home from a candy store um, having bought some candies and, 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 and soft drink uh, and was just on his way home in a, in a rainy night wearing a hoodie. And that's obviously a young black male fitting into every pattern of uh, uh, so-called criminal suspect uh, behavior. Uh, that's why George Zimmerman spotted him. That's why he followed him, even against the advice of the police officer. Um, and while we don't know exactly how the uh, violent confrontation uh, came about, because we know only one side of the story, because the, the other side, Reverend Martin, is dead and couldn't tell his side of the story. Uh, but nevertheless, what's very clear is uh, that racial profiling of um, Trevor Martin was the initial cause of all the tragedy that unfolded afterwards. And that's, uh, I think, the big story in America right now. Um, black American, African American friends of mine uh, write on their Facebook pages and so on, uh, what, does, what, what message does all this send to my family, to my kids? That means they are not safe in the streets just because of being what they are black young males. And the racial profiling, I mean, the racial profiling in itself is, is, is something bad, but it, it is exacerbated by the fact that you have people walking around, particularly in Florida, who have weapons that can kill someone if they're thinking in a racial profiling way. Um, is that being communicated, would you say, Barrett, to the world? Yeah, <clears throat> I think so. I mean, most parts of the world have difficulties understanding the obsession of Americans with guns. Um, we, in, in Germany, we are more or less proud of uh, not having an armed society, but uh, about having police and security forces being armed and the rest of society not. While there are always some criminals who have access to guns in some way, that's not a common thing to have mm -hmm. a gun in your house. Uh, and nobody thinks of self-protecting uh, by using a gun uh, and deadly force. So this is one cultural device we have with Americans. But America itself is divided over that too. Yeah, I mean, is. we have seen all the discussion over the last couple of months. Uh, uh, and after all, the, the NRA, the, the National Rifle Organization, the biggest lobby organization in Washington, or one of the biggest, yeah. uh, has prevailed in, in, in uh, just having Senate not confirming any and not passing any of those. I, I was in the United States um, the last two weeks, and I was in the U.S. when the verdict came, da came down in the Zimmerman case. And um, I talked to a lot of, of African Americans, particularly um, when I was traveling back here to Europe. And what is interesting is, um, I didn't hear a lot of people talking about the gun problem. 
they were really fixated on the racial profiling and, and the racism that still exists in America. And you know, I threw out a couple of times in conversations, well, wouldn't it be an easier topic, racism, wouldn't it be easier to deal with if we didn't have the threat of death walking around with everyone, you know, on, on their belt, that being a gun? And when I would use that logic, a lot of people looked at me like I was from Mars. <laughs> and that, that disconnect is so big in the United States. Um, and I'm wondering if that is being communicated outside of the United States, and just how big that disconnect is. I think it's a little bit what uh, foreign correspondents, German correspondents uh, in the United States always try to do is uh, somehow translating American thinking to the rest of the world because there are really some differences in, in, uh, in there. Uh, the, the whole relation between society and government. Um, uh, a lot of people, not only uh, hardcore Tea Partiers, um, in the United States think that small government is a good uh, thing, that government shouldn't have too much power and so on. Right. Um, and, and this, in part, it's a good thing, of course, but in other part, uh, it, it leaves uh, society to do whatever it wants and to uh, self-proclaimed uh, wannabe cops like uh, George Zimmerman right. uh, to go out of control uh, in this kind of, uh, of incidents we saw in the Trevor Martin case. Yeah, I, I had a conversation, too, um, last weekend. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned the fact that if George Zimmerman had not had a gun on him, um, maybe Trayvon Martin would be alive today. Um, and I said, you know, this whole stand your ground policy and the, the right to carry guns everywhere um, is part of the problem. And what I heard from people saying, uh, the reaction was, well, you have to be able to defend yourself. And that is something I never hear here in Europe when people are talking about security or when they're talking about society. No one is talking about being your own militia because nobody has guns in the first place. Right. I mean, I wouldn't even know how to get a gun here in Germany. I mean, I'd have to do some serious homework. And in the States, you know, I could go buy ammunition at Walmart. Um, it, it, it is a, a completely different culture. Um, Baron, do you think criminal civil rights charges should be filed against George Zimmerman? I think it will be hard to prove, as it was hard to prove, uh, second-degree murder in the, in the trial that just ended uh, on, on Saturday. Because, after all, um, I mean, he has not no record of being an outspoken racist, white supremacist. He is half Latin American. Um, and that, that has not been, um, that's not part of the discourse either. He is, he's, he's Hispanic, he's, he's part Hispanic. Yeah, right. Um, so we have these minorities that are intersecting in this. Um, I mean, what, what, what you have is, um, you have that completely, I mean, th there's just two different experiences. One from, um, maybe even really intimidated white people in uh, neighborhoods fearing uh, for young black males to rob their house to uh, and and that's a reality too i mean most that's of the right. of the crimes and robberies and armed robberies are committed by young black males right. so uh, trayvon martin uh, just fit into that pattern but then you have the uh, perspect uh, perspective of all those black families just like uh, Barack Obama said, uh, mm -hmm. if he had a son, it, he would look li exactly like Trayvon Martin. And yep, a friend exactly. of mine, a black American friend of mine, wrote the same thing. She was moving uh, 20 years ago with her young son in that uh, time uh, to a neighborhood that was uh, before predominantly black, uh, white, I'm sorry, in Washington, D.C. And uh, she recalls how many times um, her kid was uh, uh, stalled, mobbed in the street, asked by somebody he, he, if he really belonged there, people calling the police just because right. of him being there. And that's the experience a lot of black families share. And yeah. somehow the verdict, the non-guilty verdict, confirms that this is how, it, how it's uh, uh, good to be. Huh? Yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, there are a lot of things coming out of this verdict. I, I heard a, in the United States, too, a, a lot of journalists asking, was it possible for an all-female jury to come up with a rational verdict? Because five of the six women on the jury had children, their mothers. And they said, so they're going to identify with Trayvon Martin's mother. Um, and I was listening to that, and I thought, my gosh, this is like, this is misogyny here. These are misogynist reporters, and they don't even realize. That, that was one thing that came up. But um, I think what people are taking out of this, and this is what I hear from a lot of people, is that um, America will only be able to make real progress in racial relations when it gets its gun problem under control. Because it, 
every, I mean, think about it. In the 90s, we had the Rodney King riots. Now we're, we're having protests. And it's all about, it's about weapons and violence. Um, I even heard somebody say at the airport in New York, America needs to be more European when it comes to this. Are you reporting that? <laughs> well, but, but that's only one part of the story. I mean, there are a lot of Americans who really don't want to be like our Europeans because they think Europe is socialism and uh, uh, it's a controlled it's society Obama and no freedom and so on. Right. Uh, so, I mean, America is a divided country and a politically uh, very polarized country. What has this verdict last done, though, to America's uh, image of being a successful melting pot? I, I think you always had this kind of contradictions. Uh, you had a lot of success in being a melting pot because no one is uh, suspected or has been uh, badly regarded because of not speaking very fluent English because a lot of people have an immigrant story and learn English. Um, and that's much harder here. Right. If you speak back bad German, then you're uh, regarded uh, much worse than if you speak back bad English in America. Uh, but on the other hand, you have all those ethnic groups um, uh, suspecting each other, the Hispanics, the blacks, the Asian people in some communities, very very well segregated. You have the, 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 the Latin American communities in all the big cities uh, and the other groups uh, just uh, fearing for their jobs. Or, and so you have a lot of uh, things. And then you have violence, sometimes gang violence, sometimes domestic violence, um, sometimes criminal violence uh, in just normal robbery cases. And all this is not really a success story, but a success story is that nobody doubts that all these people are American. And that's what we have in Germany. For example, right. that f foreigners here are still regarded f as foreigners. I know. Even I, if they I, live here for three I have that conversation all the time with taxi drivers yeah. here in Berlin. They've lived here all their lives, but they don't feel German. Uh, before we move on, uh, yes or no, um, is America's image in the world worse off today um, because of the Zimmerman verdict? Yes or no? What do you say, Zandro? I'd say no. It's probably to it's it's an, it's a relevant incident, but probably too small to disrupt the general image of okay. the U.S. Anastasia. I think no. America always looks the same. Okay, it looks the same. All right. Well, there you go. All right. Now, since we've been talking about justice and politics in the U.S., we want to move and talk about justice and politics in Russia. This week, judges are due to announce the verdict in a trial that could very well illustrate just how dangerous it is to dare to criticize the Putin administration. Political dissent could be a one-way ticket to prison in Russia. Take a listen. Alexei Navalny faces charges that he conspired to steal timber, an accusation that could bring him a six-year jail term. But that is not the only possible consequence of his trial. If he is convicted, even with a suspended sentence, he will be prevented from taking part in September's election to become mayor of Moscow. Navalny emerged as a key figure of the opposition to President Vladimir Putin in the anti-government street protests of 2011. His support grew because of his blog exposing corruption among officials, and he has said he will run for the presidency in 2018. The case follows that of Sergei Magnitsky, a lawyer who was put on trial after he uncovered corruption. He died following brutal treatment while in custody. Magnitsky's conviction last week, four years after his death, symbolizes for many observers what is wrong with Russia's justice system. Anastasia, I mean, this is a big week for Russia. Is it going to be a good week or a dark week? It depends, of course, on the sentence for Alexei Navalny. And, uh, what do you expect? What, what do you think the verdict's going to be? For me, it's uh, quite similar to the situation with uh, Mikhail Khodorkovsky because he also tried uh, to participate in election to Moscow parliament uh, in uh, 2005. And uh, after he was sentenced uh, and after appeal, uh, he just has no, uh, had no uh, possibility to participate in these elections. And, uh, there were uh, quite uh, no. There were some people who was uh, against uh, this sentence. It's about you know, some uh, hundreds in Moscow uh, who was organizing actions of protest, but it uh, it's not helped him, unfortunately. You uh, let, let's talk a little bit about your story because I mean you have a direct connection to what's um, happening with uh, with Navalny. I mean you 
had to leave Russia. Tell us a little bit about why you had to leave Russia. Uh, we had very big pr uh, protests uh, after election to a Russian parliament uh, in Putin's inauguration in 2012, uh, right? It was before, before even, but after inauguration, the situation a little bit changed. It's a long story, but the most important thing is that about 100,000 uh, people fortunately at least uh, uh, hit up the streets in Moscow. It, uh, and I was waiting for that about four years. Years during my participation but in the position. But you were part of these protests, right? You you helped yeah. organize these protests it was against. Just in, in Putin. imaginable uh, some years ago, and it's happened uh, yeah. finally. And uh, why, we, why did you feel you had to leave the country? Uh, because uh, after the last demonstration of 6th of May, I just uh, Russia uh, government provocated conflict with police, and they started to arrest people. And after that, they said uh, that was not a protest; it was riots. And uh, responsible for that rights persons will be arrested and I understand so that you, one... So were you afraid you were going to be arrested? I'm not afraid, but uh, just not my idea to sit uh, imprisoned in Russia because I have a lot of uh, useful things to do, and uh, in particular for my country. All right, so you wanted to, you wanted to avoid being arrested. I mean, you know, that, that, that's, a, that's a terrible... I was arrested for five days. Okay, but and then you left. I the was country. sitting together with Navalny. He was the uh, nearest uh, camera to me. It, it's a terrible indictment on your home country that you feel like you have to leave um, for your own safety just because you have protested against um, what the government's doing. No, of course it's uh, so strange to know that you really like your country and want to do something for your country, but some guys from government uh, think that they know better what, is, what uh, should be uh, with Russia. But I hope, uh, I, of course, I have my own opinion uh, how Russia, which kind of Russia should be, which kind of country. And these uh, guys in government, they just have uh, other opinion. And of course, I don't like it because they only care about their own money and gas and oil and that's all. And, and you want to go back to Russia, right? I mean, I mean, we were talking uh, on your Twitter account. You know, you say never asked for asylum. Yes. Um, you, you want to go back and you want to help change the country. Um, a lot of people, and we're talking about, we're all foreigners here, um, look at Russia and see it as a big mess um, and see it being under the, the thumb of Vladimir Putin. What can change that and what can change that peacefully? Or do you think it can be changed peacefully? You mean uh, to change uh, to after Putin? Yeah, the Putin system. I mean, the fact what that... Be changed? Right. Well, the fact that if you dissent, if you criticize the government, bad things can happen to you, for example. Um, that is part of, that's part of the, the justice system. Yes. I mean, people, you, I think you would agree that that's what happens in Russia when, um, when people dare to criticize. How can that be taken out of society? I mean, human rights, how can they be protected without some type of revolution taking place? Um, to change the system is not so, um, um, not so easy. And uh, even the European Union work a lot about it. But uh, if we will change him, uh, exactly this uh, system of justice, I think it's uh, really long and very hard work and at first we should change government i think because people a lot of people really care about uh, they already not need to be changed because a lot of russians now really uh, has this democratic view but the problem is uh, that uh, it's like in belarus now because it's uh, persons who really has democratic views they could leave russia and mm -hmm. live in germany and i saw a lot of people who left russia and uh, they could stay and change government and they just should be sure they will not be arrested for that okay um you, you have faith that during the next elections, for example, that a peaceful change of power can take place that will also bring in changes in how the justice system is, is carried out. I mean, do you have faith that democracy will work in your favor in Russia? 
it depends on government because really a lot of people has democratic view and they don't want to have this kind of problems with police, with justice and so on because everybody feels that. That if you will be in court, you have a lot of uh, uh, possibilities to be arrested, doesn't matter what you did. And uh, a lot of people understand that, but just the problem that government has uh, for uh, has right, has possibilities to arrest people, to kill people, and uh, it's hard to change uh, for usual people. I mean, um, Alexei Navalny will, you know, he'll get this ruling, this verdict this week, and it will decide the rest of his life. I mean, he wants to be the, the next mayor of Moscow, right? And he'd also like to be the next president of Russia. I mean, he is the big enemy to Vladimir Putin. Um, Vladimir Putin cannot allow him to get out of this legal process clean, can he? Because he can't allow Navalny to come out and be able to run for office in Moscow and become the mayor of Moscow, right? Yeah, that's true. I mean, do you think there's going to be massive protests then if Navalny is found guilty and is put in prison and taken out of the political process in Russia? Um, that should be, of course, because it's just unfair what's going on with him. But, uh, but do I you think, think... Do you think people are going to go out on the streets? I mean, I, I, I'm trying to... I think, think it will be some thousands of people, about 10 or something like that. It's not enough, of course. Yeah, I mean, do you, is it being talked about in Russia the way we're talking about it right now? Are people talking about Navalny being a litmus test for the justice system, for the judiciary, and for democracy in Russia? Are people talking about yeah, this situation? Yeah, they're talking, of course, but Russia, as you know, is quite big. There are um, uh, 103 and 43 per people, a million people living there, and uh, not uh, all of them are aware of this case, of course. And uh, um, unfortunately, uh, but on the other side, fortunately, Moscow is quite polit uh, politically the city which is uh, interested in policy. Yeah. And there are a lot of people who are aware of this case. And uh, just the fact that I don't think that uh, 100,000 people will run the streets once again. I okay. think it's only once, uh, some thousands. Okay, so some thousands. Um, before we move on, Zandro and Baron, let me ask um, both of you. Um, is Russia on a path towards more democracy or less democracy based on what we're hearing from Anastasia? I think it's on the path to less democracy uh, because after all, after, after a decade of Putin politics, uh, the system is so uh, cemented and, and so, so fixed. And uh, I mean, all those cases, Khodorkovsky and all the journalists who were being intimidated or even killed, um, it's just an intimidation for everyone uh, else and it's a clear signal if you show up to criticize the government then bad things can happen to you and that works uh, for a time. Yeah, I mean, what, what do you say, Sandra, I mean, about the role of the German government? Shouldn't they be more vocal in criticizing Putin? I mean, Anastasia should not have to leave her home country. She shouldn't have to come to Germany. She should be able to stay in Russia and protest. Yeah. Well, but the situation in Russia is pretty difficult. We always wonder what, what, what actually drives the Kremlin to, to uh, generate that much amount of control because we got that in the security community as well. Uh, when you talk to the people, uh, they're, they're very professional yeah. and very good to talk to, but the amount of power and what they're allowed to say is determined by how close they are to the Kremlin. So mm -hmm. you, there's always a large amount of control in any of this. And we wonder if that's just the, the KGB background of Putin, probably the mentality to, to run the country this way, or if he really needs this much power and control to stay in power. Uh, so, and, but anyway, it's, it's difficult to, to address that topic because they're very sensitive about yeah, it. Yeah, obviously, so, and there's a lot of... For, from a diplomatic point of view, the, the question is, uh, if you address it, then you lose your impact to them. And if you're probably just going uh, going to be a bit more moderate with them and soft with them, then you, from a real political point of view, you can do more good for the country than if you're opposing them directly. Yeah. But I would, you know, I would like it if Anastasia could go home and not fear for, for her safety. When do you think you'll be able to go home, Anastasia? When? When? Um, I will try to do that after my master program here in Berlin. So and when is that? When? Like next year or in two years? Or? No, and I'm a bachelor in Estonia and then master in Germany. Hopefully. So we're talking about four, five, six years? I think three. All right. Okay. Be fast. All right. Well, we hope you can definitely. 
um, go home and be safe. Russian President Vladimir Putin, he is not holding back and throwing punches at the U.S. right now. He says that U.S. authorities have trapped fugitive intelligence leaker Edward Snowden in Russia. Snowden has been offered asylum by several Latin American countries, but he still doesn't have the papers he needs to leave the Moscow airport. Mr. Putin, we wonder, of course, what role you have in that. Well, the spying scandal is rocking Europe as Snowden tries to plot his next move. And all of this could become a political bomb here in Germany with just two months before national elections. When you see every Edward Snowden claims to possess thousands of documents showing the extent of covert surveillance carried out by the United States. The National Security Agency says it needs the data to combat terrorism, but the potential uses go much further than that. Snowden believes much of the information gathering violates both U.S. law and privacy laws in other countries. Germany has been targeted more than any other European country. Chancellor Angela Merkel says the U.S. must tell the government what it's doing. Now is the time to seek intensive dialogue about what's permissible. I'd like to stress the ends do not justify the means. That will be the German approach in these negotiations. At the same time, intelligence agencies in Germany and elsewhere are alleged to have known what was going on. They may even have actively participated in the snooping. And Sandro, is, is that a surprise, or should it be a surprise to anyone? Well, none of that has really been a surprise for the security community. We've had these rumors for years, and actually I've been talking to that about that on, on talks for the past four or five years, that this is a clear option. Because the technology was there and the interest was there, the, law, the laws were there in, in, uh, in the U.S., and it was open to the Secret Services. They would have been stupid if they wouldn't have done it. It's interesting, though. Germany is a country where politicians and the public, they place a, a high premium on protecting personal data, personal information. And yet, at the same time, you have the German intelligence community working with the NSA to spy, some would say, on Germans. I mean, how do you, um, how do you reconcile that? Yeah, well, uh, it's a difficult relation, um, but uh, one, one thing I think that is very important for the German mentality to understand that is that Germans are very concerned with uh, the German state doing something like that to the Germans, because that's a sort of a, historical, a historically difficult relation, uh, but there seems to does be much less outrage but does now it mean that less? it's foreign intelligence. Yeah, th th does it mean less if a foreign power, if the United States is, is doing it? Yeah, absolutely. It's, I mean, it's less of a threat. emotionally, it seems to be much less relevant and much, much less dangerous than when the Germans are doing that to the Germans. Yeah, um, the German Chancellor said uh, yesterday, uh, beginning of this week, um, that she had made it clear to Washington that um, the U.S. has to respect German laws as it continues to spy. And um, she said has, they have to respect German laws on German soil. On German soil. Which is a very elegant formulation because everything they did, they did on the U.S. soil. So that they don't really have to respect anything. But isn't, isn't a comment like that, I mean, she's saying a lot there by not saying much. I mean, isn't she saying th that um, Germany accepts the fact that the U.S. is somewhat of a benevolent big brother and we know that the NSA, other s American security agencies, are spying on us here? and. Um, We'll let them do that. Well, there seems to be some some uh, benevolent tolerance uh, for that kind of behavior, especially because we apparently we benefited from some of the terrorist uh, searches they did. Uh, although that remains to be proven, that's just a, a hypothesis which is there now. Um, it's really difficult to judge for the Germans. The Germans are very concerned with anything the German secret services do, the German police does. Uh, but they seem to be much less concerned with uh, foreign intelligence, especially when you get security outcomes from there. Um, it seems to be an entirely different story, also from, from, from a legal point of view, but mm. also from an ethical point of view. Um, uh, so it's hard to judge. And it's also hard to judge because uh, it's uh, before the elections now, and so, yeah. of course, all the parties are pretty mad about this. Uh, right. I mean, the, you know, they're angry, they're upset about it, although they've all been complicit in it. Bernd, do you see this, uh, this NSA story becoming a political hot potato um, in September when we have national elections here? I don't think so, actually. So, I, so <coughs> the Chancellor Angela Merkel, she doesn't have anything to worry about? Um, no, not for that. No, no. No, because after all, I mean, uh, 
First of all, uh, even if the opposition parties try to exploit it a little bit and, and making critical, critical points about the, the government, the trip of our uh, Minister of the Interior now to, to Washington, mm -hmm. he was blamed by the opposition for not making a good point and in, in, in defending German sovereignty and so on. Uh, but after all, uh, most people, I guess, suspect that uh, with the SPD government it would have been exactly the same. After all, because uh, nobody would would want to, 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 to put the cooperation with the United States and terrorism uh, in, in the war on terror uh, uh, at risk uh, just because of claiming that. And most of all, most Germans don't f really feel threatened. I mean, a lot of friends of mine who are computer nerds, but they say, hey, that's what I always suspected. I'm not surprised, and I don't have nothing to, nothing to hide. Right. I, I, I hear that all the time. I hear that here. I also hear that um, on the other side of the Atlantic, people say they... They suspect that their telephone calls are being monitored, their emails are being monitored, but they say if you're not doing anything um, wrong, what do you have to hide? But it, it's interesting what you say. It doesn't matter what type of government you have. They're going to go along with this surveillance. And we hear that in the United States, too. Obama's got a lot, he's um, you know, gotten a lot of flack for continuing policies um, from the Bush administration. So this whole surveillance world is bigger than any political direction, right? And but doesn't that makes it more permanent. I, I wonder if that's something that people should be afraid of. I think they should be. And one, one very important dimension which is not being discussed that much is the international dimension. Because one one thing that happened immediately after these these things came out with uh, Snowden was that China and Russia who were always accused by the West of being the bad guys because they did so much surveillance on their own populace. Uh, they said, oh, so it's not that bad after all. Oh, we're, not all, we're not the bad guys anymore, and you're not the good guys anymore. Seems that we're all doing the same kind of stuff. And I think that's a very dangerous signal at the moment because a lot of other nations who are still about to become information societies get the signal now at this very point in time where they decide whether to implement a lot of uh, surveillance, probably some censorship and things like that. But isn't that... And now is, it seems to be kind of okay from yeah, but the isn't US. That pro that's propaganda too, isn't it, Sandra? I mean, no one is saying that the NSA in the United States is spying on Americans to, to limit their their freedoms i mean everyone in congress democrats and republicans say the spying that is being done is, is being done to find terrorism yeah but the russians and the chinese say the very same yeah but we know, we know we know that the russians sense. and the chinese are using it to uh, to oppress and limit sure. the freedoms of their own people yeah. and and that's the difference um, but the story is the same but the story is the same and i wonder if that difference uh, you know we talk about what's being communicated I mean, it's easy to paint the U.S. as the bad guy here, but um, how you use surveillance at the end of the day is, is, is the most important thing. The problem, I think, uh, that uh, you say they use it, uh, but mostly b against, for example, anarchists or ch no, uh, other states or terrorists because uh, U.S., no, that is just a fact, uh, just a fact, they're fighting with this kind of... Uh, activism and uh, Russia fighting with democracy that is a problem and that's why in uh, America it's just stupid to fight against a democratic activist and uh, if you uh, wrote his emails or something like uh, other you should not do anything because it's part of your system right. of American you, you've system. got this key yeah, okay Th that's true you said one reason why you left um, Russia is that you knew your telephone calls yeah, were being yeah, monitored, yeah. right? Yeah, I was calling to uh, Navalny and they just checked that I'm in that cafe and uh, to this cafe came about 20 policemen and one special policeman from this special committee for fighting with uh, so-called uh, extremism and they arrested on me in that cafe. Yeah, I mean, you know, that in itself, we see in what direction all this surveillance can go in, um, how, it, how it can oppress people. I, I'm wondering, what does this mean for the Internet? Because the Internet seems to be the, the, the battleground here. And uh, there are a lot of people fighting for the Internet to remain neutral and to remain open. Can it remain that way if it's going to be the forum where all of this spying and surveillance takes place? It's about control when you're spying, isn't it? Well, I think the Internet is really one big traitor, and if you've got the resources and the interest to exploit that capability to actually tell you everything about everyone, uh, then you're just going to do it, and that's that's probably the greatest threat. I think in the, in, in, in the long term, where it will develop in the free states, free nations, uh, democratic state of law, 
uh, it will be a, a marvelous tool for democracy and, and help enriching the discourse. But in other nations, more totalitarian characters and more to a leaning towards control, it will be a tool of control and oppression. Yeah. Uh, you know, before we wrap things up, let, let's talk just very briefly about Edward Snowden. How do, how do you view him? Is he a whistleblower? Has he done something good? Or is he a traitor? Has he, has he leaked information that he shouldn't have and, you know, turned his back on his own country? I think, uh, well, for, for us, he did some good, uh, because after all, uh, it's good that the public, after all, knows what's, what's being done, uh, and not only sus suspect that that might be uh, ongoing, but from a legal point of view, from the United States, he, he is clearly a traitor. Um, so so I, I would want that he be protected. It's a sort of irony that uh, he's protected by Russia yeah. uh, right now, and uh, has some offers of other states which don't have a really good uh, record on, on, on civil rights. Exactly. Um, but nevertheless, uh, after all, it comes down to uh, the enemy of my enemy be my friend. Exactly. Um, and we are in a polarized world again, and so that's where he can see. We've got, we've got one minute uh, left. A Anastasia, what do you say about I Russia think. helping Snowden or giving him shelter at least? I think every democratic country should give, uh, should provide and grant him asylum. Asylum. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you think you should. What yeah. do you, Sandra, what do you think? Is, is he a traitor or, or is he a hero? Well, um, neither. He, he did some good in putting this on the agenda and, and actually giving us a chance to talk about it once more and to determine our values and what we want, especially in international relations and data protection. Uh, but to me and to, to a lot of people working in this field, nothing, nothing was really so very surprising. So from a legal point of view, he seems to be more of a traitor. From a political point of view, he did some good. Do you think he's paved the way for other whistleblowers or leakers, even in Germany? There's not that much to, to uh, whistleblow in Germany, mainly because we don't have the money to come up with uh, such amazing intelligence capabilities. Okay. Uh, so uh, the lack of resources generates a lack of whistleblowers. At the end of the day, it is all about money. Sandra, thank you very much. Anastasia Baron, thank you all for being on the show. That is going to wrap up my agenda this week. Don't forget, you can watch the show again on our website and on YouTube. And don't be shy. Tell us what you think about the show. Our inbox is always open. You see our address right there. I'm Brent Goff in Berlin. Join me next time when I set the agenda.